any opportunities are a good opportunity, I suppose. Um, just wanted to talk about our business quickly, just to sort of explain our background and what we're sort of about before I jump into the, the, the old colour well. We're all about um, the appearance of the product, not just obviously colour, but obviously the full appearance spectrum. Um, we're a second generation family business, we've been doing it over 30 years, um, and we've worked quite closely. Uh, some people might know the, the Hunter Lab brand of uh, businesses, uh, of business, but we've been uh, we've been the rep, the rep for uh, over 30 years now. Um, and we handle the two sides of uh, two sides of colour, I suppose, industrial colour measurement, actually the product, but then also the print and packaging side as well. Uh, to start, I mean, what I'm going to try and cover is is just simply classifying how we or how we talk about products, um, because typically when we find a lot of customers sort of uh, they sort of say to us, "Oh, the, the colour's completely wrong," but then we we nail it down. The colour can be consistent, but it's actually um, the overall appearance that's that's making them uh, the problem. So I mean, just going through this uh, pool ball, I mean, what the words that we would describe the um, I suppose I'm just cheating because I've got it on the page, but what, uh, how would you describe the ball ball? Um, obviously we've got words such as yellow is the, the main colour. You might say slightly reddish yellow. You could say it's orange, but you could also uh, talk about how shiny, the, how shiny or, or glossy it is. So obviously what, I'm, what we want to try and do is just sort of put a bit of a colour specification together and work out what we need to sort of think about or break it down, to break our products down into easy to manageable chunks really. So obviously the first thing to look at is the main predominant um, colour. Um, we always start somewhere by saying it's a, it's a blue wall or a, um, a yellow pool ball or a red shirt or, or something like that. And that's obviously called the hue. Um, and traditionally you would always look at trying to identify that, that to start with. So we, we need to get into that sort of all part. So number one, we would say for the, for the yellow, uh, yellow pool ball, the strongest colour is, is obviously <coughs> yellow. We then um, obviously look at, um, or need to classify um, how the next part of that, how much of that colour is there. You could obviously have a quite a faded, a faded yellow, but you could also have a very strong yellow. So obviously we need to factor that in how strong or how weak the colour is. And then obviously we have lightness or darkness. Um, you can have a, a light yellow or a dark yellow, a, a dark red, a, a light red. And obviously that, that's, that's number three in sort of looking at basic colour. Um, so I'll well, put the words warning in there because once we um, we have consistent measurements of colour, so once we know that it's yellow, we'll go back to the, the ball ball, um, dependent on the surface texture, back to a point that I said before with the um, consistent colour, I could have I could have made my colour just right in the yellow ball ball, but depending on how shiny the surface is um, or how matte the surface is, it will appear different. I just wanted to pass this round just to won't take too long, but I mean, just a, a quick sort of a quick question is: Can somebody tell me is it the same? Is it the same colour or is it a different colour? Just uh, just by looking at it. Yeah. So. I think the main the main sort of point is um, a lot of people do the test and actually say, well, it's it's a different colour. Um, but yes, you're right. The, the actual colour is the same colour, but the appearance is the, the surface texture is different in so many ways that it actually appears differently to uh, to the human eye. And the, the big the big point is we've been on uh, we've been asked to invite invited to site where people have said, look, we've got colour issues. We look and we, we do some measurements on a machine, and it's there's no colour issues. It's the surface texture or a coating that's been put on top. So I mean, obviously there's. We've got to look at two different. Uh, we've got to take all of these factors into consideration, um, and obviously it's all about reflecting light back from a surface. And different surfaces reflect light back um, in different ways. So obviously, high gloss, semi gloss, and matte. It's the same, as I say, the same colour but different different appearance. And then just another, I suppose, surface characteristic to sort of uh, bring into. <coughs> into what we do is you might have consistent colour, we might have sorted that out, you might have consistent surface texture, that might all be there. Um, but then you have the, the further issue of we've got something else developing over the surface of the actual product. So if you were applying a coating to a product, if it's going outside or um, in a liquid for example, you can get um, contamination in the product 
you've done absolutely nothing wrong, it's just that the surface coating is now changing the overall appearance or the perception of the product. So that's the final thing that we've got to really, um, I suppose, think about, because it, as I say, the product could be fine, but what you're doing to it or when they're applying to it can cause um, customers to ring up and say, well, there's something completely wrong with this or um, your product wrong, sort of thing. Um, I'm going to try and put some numbers on this now to um, communicate what we're talking about. Um, pick the brick, because I thought it was the most uh, relevant thing. Um, and obviously the first thing that we need to sort of build a specification for colour or appearance, we need an object. Um, excuse the, the old American drawing. We, uh, we need a light source. Um, a light source dependent on, uh, there's many different light sources. Um, but we need a light source that sort of represents what, how we're all viewing the product. Um, for example, daylight, D65, average daylight. Um, you've got a house lamp, is, is sort of like a tungsten lamp, and then you've also got your fluorescent as well. And all these uh, light sources will provide a different look on the actual product. So for example, with the brick, if you were to take that outside and look at it, it might look completely different to that if you're looking in the factory under the, sort of the old factory light, if you're not to me. So customers potentially would say, well, there's nothing wrong with it here, but then when it's in, let's say, in the wall at home, you can actually see, dependent on the light, that there's actually um, something wrong with it. So obviously we have to work out a way to, I suppose, QC the, uh, or select the right light source, if you know what I mean. And just one thing to add, I mean, possibly some of you have been uh, writing colour specifications or what before, um, but one of the main um, preferred methods for writing or choosing light is based on the energy that's sort of sent back from the light source. And daylight happens to be the most stable, if you're not know, If you can see from the, the drawing, everything else is quite, it flares up. D65 was, is, is classed as the most stable light source for us to sort of perceive a product and, and standardise to. And then, finally, you'd need like an observer. Um, simply this, a lot of work was done on how the human actually sees an object. Um, Originally, back in the 1930s, it was they actually um, came out with something called the two-degree observer, similar to the way you're looking through a pair of binoculars. Um, later on, they came up and said, "Well, hang on a sec. Everybody doesn't walk around looking through a pair of binoculars. It sort of says it's wider area view, and this is where the, the two-degree or ten-degree observer comes from." So, typically, when you'll see a specification or a customer might customer or standard might say D65 10, it's typically at the light source and the way that the human is sort of is looking at them. <coughs> Once it's all it's all mashed together in a nice big cake um, with mathematics. Now, I'm not a mathematician so I can't go into the calculations, but you simply put your light source together with the, the value taken from the, the object, the reflectance value, um, to give you a visual stimulus and then um, times with what well, gives you the <coughs> observer, which would give you a very basic uh, tri-stimulus colour measurement reading, which is X, Y, and Z, um, red, green, blue. And not early colour measurement, 1930s people, again, used this method to sort of assign values to, to the product that they had. Um, but the main point, that well, it's, it's quite difficult to understand, especially if you've got to try and talk about the mathematics or, or talk about it. I can't really say, let's say to Sean, I want a tile, if, if you don't mind me just using it as an example, I want a tile with X, Y, and Z on it, you potentially could, but it's quite difficult to talk over the phone still, back to the, the ball ball. Um, I can't say um, X, Y, Z, because the man at the end of the phone isn't, isn't really interpreting it the same, or can't interpret it the same. Um, so luckily for us, uh, with the business, uh, a man called Richard Hunter, in 1942, um, he was a colour scientist in America, and he basically said, based on opponent colour theory, because you could obviously never have a yellow, blue, or a red green, or a, a light, dark, or dark light, um, he came up with the opponent colour theory, but he said it was three-dimensional. So back to when we sort of talk about, um, we look at the hue, we look at the chroma, but we also look at the, the value of the light, he's sort of saying there should be one measurement that sort of reflects all that and he invented the, the, the Hunter LAB scale um, and it was a simple way of sort of communicating or quality controlling um, what we see and it, it, self-explanatory so you would get typically three values that I'll, I'll show you there um, L100 is white or perfectly white 
50 would be in the middle, grey, and L for 0 is, is black or dark. If you were to get a big positive number on the A, it would be red. Um, or if you're, the, the bigger number was uh, on the B axis, you would, positive would be yellow, or negative would be blue, and obviously on A would be red or be, would be green. Um, and again, we'll do some measurements in a, in a second, but we, you would typically be able to pinpoint in colour space exactly what the product looks like. Um, and from a quality control point of view or a colour matching point of view, people were then able to start consistently matching the way the product looks. So I can say, okay, I want my LAB values to be to be this, or I want it to be this, or it needs to be less. It needs to be less on the A. And instead of talking about colour or the way things look, we actually said we talk numbers. And obviously people can interpret numbers, and if we use instrumentation that's sort of similar um, or in the same area, built to a, a standard, we're in a, we're able to sort of make very consistent products. What it sort of led on to though was the, back to the difference, different surface textures or different, depending on how smooth the uh, surface is. So for example, a, a ceram tile was a very smooth surface. You would notice the difference in, um, let's say, lightness a lot more than you would in a bag of Walker's crisps. So there's obviously, um, human is able to perceive colour difference on different surfaces a lot easier dependent on the, on the surface finish. Um, but with the, the delta, you're obviously allowed to, you're able to set a standard and work back or back or forward from that standard. So as an example, if I went to, um, let's say brick, um, if it was too dark, you could potentially relate that to the fact that it's been um, overheated or overcooked for a long period of time. Um, if it was too light, it could be that it's not, not been fired properly uh, or for a long period of time. But also you could look at how deep the colour is as well. So we're, we're sort of combining all those values um, into one, but you can also strip them down and work out and relate it to the process as well. I suppose just before I move on, is there any questions just on what I've sort of gone? Typically, the, I'm just going to talk about the tools that we've got that are available in the market to sort of talk about what we're, uh, what we're going through, uh, what I've explained. Typically, to um, understand the effects of the light source, um, because as I say, different light sources are available. You've got different lighting conditions for different different uh, areas of the world, different times of the day, um, and different <coughs> rooms, for example. So there is a something called a light booth um, that you can have different light sources in. You can place your product in there, and you can actually visually visually see what it would look like under those under those conditions. Um, and obviously, you would uh, using the switches flip between uh, the different. Um, light settings and you would actually physically see the difference and that's the first early uh, entry level part to uh, making sure that the product looks the same under different conditions if you have to me. Um, setting um, appearance you can use colour standards, um, obviously I've put SRAM in there again. Um, NCS is a good is a, is a scale that we, we work quite closely with because you can pass that to a customer and say what do you want it to look like and they can say that and then you can actually physically make a map to that product and it's a set standard. So there's no, um, the customer doesn't turn around and say, oh, that's not right, or we, don't, we want it a bit less, we want it a bit more red, or a little bit more orange, or that sort of thing. You're actually able to pinpoint exactly what you want, and both work to that standard. So you don't have to, there's no uncertainty or anything like that. Um, based on what I talked about on the, the surface texture, um, you've, you can look at how glossy something is. Now obviously the more gloss typically leads to the, the, the product look, look, looking a lot lighter. Um, so controlling gloss is another, is another method there to make sure that you keep it consistent levels. If you've got one product that has got a glaze on it and the, the value is sky high, it's going to look completely different to something with a, with a, without, without this, uh, the gloss on it. Typically what I've, uh, what I've bought today as well is the preferred method nowadays and everybody, sh well we're hoping everybody would start moving away from sort of using the human human eye into um, technology like the colour meter, the spectrophotometer. Um, obviously it's, it's able to document the product um, and store that for like 10 to 20 years um, and it gives you lighting conditions and it's able to get the values in LAB for example that, that we talked about, um, but it's able to interpret those results for you into different light sources so it's sort of like a, a light booth and a human being all in one box um, and you can take that data and you can send that to a colleague 
a colleague could have one as well, and they can standardise on both of it and try and work to the same same sort of standard. Um, but also, it's a very easy way. It gives you the difference on there as well. So you would be able to to work out what's uh, what's happening in, let's say, the lightness or darkness, or what colour needs to change. It would give you all that information in there. You can take things online. Um, technology's moved on now. The, <coughs> um, you could take a, a spectrophotometer online um, and actually put that. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, when a quality manager is not in the lab and it's left to the, the process guys, you can actually leave that running and it would give them the data to say well, you need to make an action or this is fine or document it in live time. Um, and finally, um, vision systems, typically with a camera, um, you can zoom right in with a microscope or we can actually place a, a typical vision system online to look for defects um, and matched with the spectra trend, the, the, the one before you are actually able to uh, look at total colour and defect detection all in one. So if, for example, on the brick, if it's missing a hole or, uh, I mean, let's take Jammy Dodgers as a good example, the, the middle of the Jammy Dodger, you can see if it's in there or if it's out, but also if it's actually look at the colour of that as well. Um, and that's all combined in sort of one or two, two instruments that are on the, uh, on the market today. Um, it's gone a little bit quicker than I thought, but um, I just wanted to sort of explain a little bit about our, our business. We're, um, as I say, we're second generation, um, but we start at the, the start of the, uh, the process, so the design and concept, and provide the consultancy. Uh, but we'd go through and try and, when the first uh, product's used, the, uh, created the prototype, we would work with you to develop the way the product looks and help you control <coughs> it. Um, and then when it's rolled out into production, we again work with you to sort of say, how do we control the product, how the product's looking, or how do we control what the customer's sort of saying coming back. Um, we calibrate and we service and repair um, to, to national physical laboratory standards, and for all, we support all our installations. Um, and we also do in-house testing and we run our own matching laboratory as well. Okay. So I've got a, there any questions, because Dave's asked me to um, just run a few, a few samples through the, uh, the machine. Yes. Is there any questions? Or? Yes, sir. Um, how do you prepare your standard? Um, having moved out of the sanitary industry into the brick industry, yeah. I get extremely frustrated by the European brick manufacturers who say that colour doesn't change with time. Yep. Having worked with Frank Malkin, the key to any colour measurement system is making sure that your standard had age. Any glaze that we had at Plyford, if we tried to make that as a standard initially, yep. we were leading ourselves down the very slippery path. We always had to ensure that those standards were exposed to UV light, UVB I think more yep. than A. Do you recommend a, a procedure for choice of standards, particularly choice of standards within an industrial environment? It's okay when you're talking a chromic tile that's flat. Yep. How do you do something like that for... Are we, are we talking the actual... So, If you wanted to choose a brick standard yep. for a particular colour, yep. what would you do to that brick standard, that brick colour, before you called it a standard? I mean, if we're talking about preservation of the standard, um, I mean, typically... It's, it's not preservation, it's it's how the colour changes with exposure to the UV line. You see, typically, if, I mean, with, with, with the standards, we tend to keep them isolated out of... Um, I suppose either natural light or any UV light. Yeah. Um, if that's part of the standard that says expose this to the light to make it natural, I suppose. If well, we're following Crown's work, we always, in the sanitary industry, whenever we chose any pieces that are going to be, when we produce tiny new colours, yeah. we always expose those to UV light. Yeah. Um, it always shifted. Yeah. Um, but then it stabilised. Yep. Um, generally, for, for a sanitary colour, you were talking in terms of three days, and you, you, you know, we were, we were there and thereabouts. We tended to go for, for a week. <coughs> when we were choosing actual pieces to use as standards, because we still believe what we see with our eyes, yes. yeah, yeah. those were the ones where we, we really like, exposed them. Them to UV light before we said that's the standard because it will change. Yeah, I mean, there's got to be a time 
where well, we've seen this before, if you if you sort of it's got to be a time where that's like you say that that's at the point that you can make your standard from. Yeah, and we would accelerate it. Do you recommend accelerating, or do you just say keep it like that to make sure it's not exposed? Or? As long as it's, <coughs> I would try and follow a natural process or, or part of. I would try and match the. Say if it was a brick, for example, that you wanted to look at the weather inside, or you tried to set your standard. No, to, I'm, I'm not necessarily looking at the weathering. I'm talking how that colour changes under UV light. Yeah, UV, well, UV exposure, I would, in terms of accelerating it to a point, I mean obviously that test got to be controlled, hasn't it, to simulate what's actually happening. Um, if it was a brick in a wall, there's, there's a certain amount of UV exposure. Um, what, I, what I would say um, is once it is at that point, and I mean, we're, what, well yeah, when it's at that point, I would take an instrument, an instrumental method yeah. reading yeah, on it and actually that's, set that. It, it's purely simple. Once yep. you've done it, making sure it's stabilised, and, and I'm, I'm intrigued how you would do that on a brick, that's all. We'll have to run some tests. <laughs> um, I mean, it depends, based on what, what, it depends, well, I don't, I don't know why. You've answered my question as far as I, th I think, I'm trying to, it, well, it depends. If it was when you brought in standards, and I know a lot of work was done in Quran. We, <coughs> it depends how often you, I mean, we've, we do work with Huntsman, and Huntsman, without going into too much detail, make a, uh, a white pigment that goes into the paint. Yeah. Now the issue, that's um, it photo grade. Now they have to do a, a certain amount of tests to just even make the standard, and that standard is actually only valid for, I think, uh, two days, <coughs> and they have to remake it. Right. So that standard gets made and pressed, and then they change it and yeah, move on. Yeah, yeah. I would, based on what your, I suppose, the industry or what standard you work working to, to sort of simulate UV exposure, in terms of accelerating it, as long as um, it's a natural test, so it's actually relative to what is actually... I, I talk about outside in the brick, because I know we've, we've got a plastics customer that makes building products, yeah. and they did a very similar test where they have to expose um, expose their building products in the plastic to the uh, to UV. Um, and they haven't got, I suppose, they haven't got the time to sort of leave it for the natural process, so yes, yeah, they, exactly. would, they would... I hope that sort of answered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, as long as it's a relative test and it actually does, or it's similar to what your what we can do naturally, or what the earth does to the product naturally, then I, I don't see there being a major, major issue. Thank you. Yes, sir. Can you tell me where you're based and what are your main markets? We're based in Leicestershire. <coughs> yeah. um, big industry funds has always been food, um, but we're ever more involved in um, building the building world especially with things like glasses, um, <coughs> building products. Um, we do a lot in the plastics world that overlinks into the building building products world as well. Uh, chemicals is a big one for us as well. Because they all sort of interlink. So what sort of building pro products today? A lot of plastic's a big one. Um, I don't know if you've seen like a foam-based product that's been replaced for uh, cladding. So it's supposed to be a, there's a five, no, 25 year guarantee with it. So obviously they, they have the, the colour's got to be consistent because when they put this um, stuff on the wall, it looks completely different to when it's in the factory, so they can't, they can't control that process on the line. Um, so obviously we have to set, there's a, there's a standard for that, and the machine says, look, this is out of spec. Um, typically then that rolls, um, we do a lot with Pilkington. So Pilkington, on their architectural glass, would um, use a various uh, a machine to actually QC the amount of coating thickness to that as well. Um, yeah. Have you moved into clay and concrete products? We've we've got. I mean, we for example, we work with Longcliffe um, quarries. So in terms of powders and calcium, they, they make calcium carbonate, and they use this particular machine as an example to sort of QC how white that powder actually is. Um, and obviously, if there's any uh, contaminants that are sort of uh, that are in the in the, the chalk or the the powder that they've got. Um, but as I said, well, food, food's a big one. Uh, chemicals is a big one because obviously chemicals on its own works, but then you, it interlinks with different products as well. Pharmaceutically wise, we're, we're, in, we're big in there, we do all the Pfizer's. Um, plastic, building products, um, and paper. Okay, thanks. On, on building products, are you looking at the same type of material or are you looking at different materials, concrete, plastic, bricks, etc., and trying to get a colour match between them? Both. I mean, in the sanitary industry, obviously, we were looking at 
looking at petrolates, we were looking at vitreous enamels, we were looking at porcelain, etc. And the amorism was a major thing. And just yep. wondered if that was coming through on the construction site. We, when, well, uh, building, building on its own with, I suppose, a typical <coughs> type construction, the, the other industries are trying to build something that looks realistic in that sort of market. So I suppose, I mean, where we've seen it, they're actually saying, look, we, we know what a brick looks like, we know what wood looks like, and we are trying to match to that. What, what tools have you got to um, sort of give us that effect? And they would use the, sort of like a spectrophotometer to sort of do an overall picture of, of that to try and match it to uh, that product. Where we are seeing, um, where we are seeing a lot of uh, sales in the building industry world is to sort of stand out and be competitive. Um, I suppose Britain's always prided itself on quality as well. There are, I suppose, you can get it imports from imports from a lot of places. Now, is it's a case of trying to match to keep a good, good consistent quality and, the, and with the colour as well. So we don't. Yeah, well, how do I put it? I mean, looking at the bricks, uh, the Ipswich bricks, setting a Keep keeping colour consistent if you're not here and actually getting the product out there. Um, we've had applications where they do try and match to existing bricks that are already in um, after yeah, about yeah, today. Yeah. Try and uh, I don't know. It's, it's a strange thing. People they see it when it's when it's in the pack. Um, same with ceramic tiles off the off the shelf. We've, we've been involved in that as well because it's amazing that one batch batch to batch consistency is completely shot. Um, and my auntie actually said to me, she says, "Oh, you need to go and sell a machine to it." One of these factories because she, you actually saw it. It went from a brilliant white that seemed to be like the start of like halfway through the room through to something that was quite grey, and you could actually physically see that in the in kitchen. And she wasn't happy with my uncle, let's say, because it was always his fault. But, um, that that was the sort of thing. Our, these machines are being used for more consistency and, and that sort of thing. And the main place that we sort of you know, traditionally have seen it in your plastics and your paints, it is actually floating through foods. An amazing thing. A food company could go and say, not interested, or it doesn't matter to the business. But then, as soon as somebody like a Walker's Chris turns around and says, well, it's, "We're not interested," or "This looks really bad," they're on the phone, and it's, it's a must-have if you're not on it. Yeah. So we're a, and it's, it's filtering through into other industries. The glass, the glass industry with architectural glass or cut with coloured glass in there as well is a big, is a big industry. But keeping in mind that we don't just have to measure colour; we can measure colourless products. Yeah. Um, so obviously back to the haze, you can, I mean in the, uh, I'm just trying to think of the name, there's a, a pottery company and it is it's quite an expensive pottery company. But anyway, they make a, it's one of their big applications, they said, oh we've got a major issue, um, it looked wrong. And we said, okay, take us through the making of the product and they actually showed us, showed us everything and the colour was spot on, colour, lightness, everything was fine. But back to the haze point, it was actually the haze that was causing the product to look different, the glaze of the, of the product. Yeah. Um, and it could be that there was a contaminant in there, um, but it actually ended up being the fact that it wasn't extruded properly. So not only are we measuring sort of general quality control, the way things, the colour and lightness, but we are moving into the haze and, and making that part of a process check as well. Um, I mean, the plastics company I talked about, they're, they're, biggest, they're in Ireland, their biggest um, export is actually for France, and the French are very big on making that consistent. Yeah. But it costs them a lot of money. If they, the problem is they can't make this stuff, and you, with the long board, you can't sort of angle it right. But it has to go on the wall, uh, onto the onto the house. Excuse me. But as soon as it's there, and and, the, and they've just spent forty to fifty thousand pound on this whole nice construction of this house, the good lady comes in and says, "Take it all off. It looked horrible because you can actually see." Throughout different parts of the day, the light is reflecting differently off the off the product, and that was relatively um, easy for them because it was a smooth surface. When they moved into embossing, it was all over the place. You got white streaking, you, you got you got absolutely everything. But obviously, instrumentation um, installed, you can actually keep that consistent because we're, we're simulating, we're, we're reading. I mean, especially I mean things like the, the spectra trend is actually reading how you and I perceive the the object, not just sort of an, an instrumental analytical measurement. We're actually trying to get it spot on to how you and I are looking at things on a day-to-day -day basis. So. How do you handle these low energy bulbs? Tell everybody not to use them. Yeah, I was, I was going to find a polite way to say it. You see, this is where, this is, I mean, every, I suppose, manufacturer that we're involved with that makes this equipment is very strong in their area. 
So, for example, Hunter Labs, their, Hunter Lab, their business is um, literally is colour measurement or appearance measurement. Yeah. Uh, Zetna that I showed you is they do quite a few tools, but glosses they, they concentrate on the key areas. Yeah. And, and this is something that we're interested in because I mean Hunter's R and D is purely into the point that you just raised. How do you handle this? They look at it and say, look, through distributors and sort of say, look, there's a need for this. How can we address this better? You see. Um, and one of I've got to say over a competitor, we, there's a the, the light source that's actually installed can actually. Um, Send more energy to the sample, they're uh, giving more, uh, emitting more energy band because it uses something called a xenon flash, which it emits more energy to, to represent the UV content. And it, it's ideal. We, a lot of, we win a lot of applications on darker products because a lot of competitors will say you can't get the energy back from something. But obviously, with newer technology, you, you can. You mentioned about c uh, the colour, space, and geometry earlier with the LAB. Yes. There are other um, equations that are used, yeah. like the LCH and yep. there's, there's hundreds of them sort of thing, yep. but which is the most accurate or is it horses for courses? Is there any one you recommend for a particular purpose? There's, you see, I'm, I'm not biased to this now. Different industries would shout at me because everybody prefers their own different way and method of doing it. Um, if somebody to ask me that in, in the brick world, let's say, um, we would take measurements of everything and try and look and find the best, the most accurate method uh, coming back. Food, I'm just, just going through the whole thing. Food, typically, Richard Hunter's Hunter LAB was widely adopted because of the way that it was set out. It simply is the spacing of the colour in a, in a physical chart that somebody's made um, that is actually set in that. CIE, um, they govern the way things are optically, I suppose, how we just, um, I suppose what's the best way of explaining it, the, the way that, they, that things are illuminated. Um, they came out, they, they took Richard Hunter's LAB and turned it into the CIE LAB and they adjusted the colour. Um, but then they also came out with the LCH that David talked about, which is sort of back to back to this. Um, you've still got the same lightness, but you've got, you're actually picking, based on numbers, the chroma and the hue as an angle. Mm -hmm. So obviously it's more, it's more accurate, but from a quality control point of view, it's a little bit more difficult to sort of interpret. So, Dependent on the application and I suppose the operator's knowledge, I would always start at the CIE LAB yeah. um, because of ease of use. But if I want to go into a bit more accuracy, I would step up to, to the LCH because it does give you a lot more, sort of bit more information about what uh, what sort of what's happening with the product. And are all these, the ones you've mentioned, are they all ellipsoid rather than spherical colour space? Based, well, based on, I mean, your ellipsoid, do you? If you're looking at the, the colour in space, rather than being a true sphere, it tends to be more. Yeah, it's, and they're all are they all in it? Yeah, change well. That I mean that that's based on your tolerances. So typically, when I'm setting um, tolerances to uh, where do we go? Dependent on and it's based on an industry standard again. Different industries set um, different standards of tolerances, so that will form different different shapes. In the road marking technology uh, in, in the world, we, we do a lot with road markings, um, whether applying the paint to the roads. There's actually a BS, a BS standard that they actually form a, I don't know what's called, is it lip, uh, trapezoid? Yeah, they actually, that's, that's actually how that looks on the, yeah. on the, on the space, uh, on the, in colour space. So this, dependent on what your industry standard is, there, there will be different changes, uh, different types of shapes for the pass fail tolerance. You've also got the CMC optimised colour. Yes. Yeah. Now that now there's just something to add there. Delta there's, there's something called delta L A and B is obviously the difference of lightness from a standard to a sample. Same with A and B. There's something called delta E, which is the total colour difference. But the point to add is delta E is a measurement of distance, not actual um, yeah. Um, delta CMC again it came from the textile world. They and it's all based on a commercial factor of what they feel is, is comfortable, but you can actually predict whereabouts in colour space the maximum acceptable limit and the minimum acceptable limit will be for, for the product. So it tends to be a lot smaller for ceramic, ceramic pro uh, products. When you go to things like crisps and... Uh, things you have a tolerance of ellipsoid with that, yes. uh, the, the, uh, the ratio of the L to C. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. and that will, I mean, that typically will predict where your product will fall based on Commercial factor um, is based on something called a commercial factor. Yeah. Yes, sir.
Did you mention, I didn't hear, did you mention that the moisture content of the surface will make a difference, particularly in something, say, like a brick? Because if it was slightly damp, it's going to be darker, isn't it? Yep. So you've got to be certain that the surface you're measuring is as dry as possible. Then you've got to determine what is as dry as possible. Well, um, going back a stage, we would use it to detect. Obviously, to, we mentioned standards earlier. So we have to, we mentioned, talking to David earlier about the bricks, both two shades of those bricks are actually, um, they're acceptable. Now the, I suppose the question, well, something's been done differently to that because you can physically see that it's, it's a different, different darkness, it, it, this is lighter obviously than, than, than that. Moisture is a physical measurement, but obviously when we um, look at a white t-shirt when it's damp, Obviously, it doesn't look as light or as pristine clean as something else. The L value, the lightness value, will and is a direct relationship to moisture. And we typically have, again, back to the food world, bricks is a brilliant one. Um, we, as a business, actually supply a moisture meter and a, a spectro um, into the industry to QC both sides of that, uh, just to protect you. But um, the food world, for protecting against cancerogenics, depending on the, the baking process, the lightness value, if it goes to a certain level, um, people in the industry have actually said that it's you're more likely to get cancer based uh, cancer off the, the actual product. So leading crisp factories have actually got our machines installed to monitor that L value and keep that keep that in sync to actually say I've, I've got documented proof that I'm not making everybody get cancer sort of thing. So yeah, we, we do a lot of work and this is where our business comes in. We tend to do a lot of work on the relationship between the way things look and I suppose colour data and 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 sort of things like moisture relating to the two. Carrying on from moisture, uh, I mentioned you earlier before we came into the room about colour strength. Yes. So if you were to have like a clay brick and it was dry, and on a clay brick which is wet, the same uh, from the same batch, would it affect the colour strength? Like I assume if it's wet, it might seem to have a higher colour strength possibly. Colour strength calculations are done off. Um, you see, we're collecting a lot of spectral data, so spectral data of the actual uh, the product would lead on to, uh, we calculate trends from the LAB side, all the spectral data, but it depends on what yeah. part. Um, in theory, yes, but you, we would record a, a full strength product um, and then work to that, so it's sort of... So the luminance would basically affect, uh, be affecting the equation because it won't be darker than the other, I expect. Potentially, but I believe it's based on the actual colour that's in the, so I think, I believe L, the lightness would be ignored and then your, your colour strength of colour, should I say, okay. is, is separate to that, so they're able just to look at colour strength. So obviously that's used in mainly in the matching, yep. with your K and your S value over on your um, on your on your spectrum, on your spectrum <coughs> you're actually able to take those values, and, and that's what I said earlier about um, under the different light, lighting conditions, you're able to adjust, the, the values are adjusted, and it gives you, measures full strength colour, but then it obviously can tell you how, what percent of colour is actually in it, or each sample in it. That's very, very useful because uh, part of the new stance come out for C marking of concrete blocks yep. uh, involves that you should make a block up with the pigment in yep. and then you're supposed to take a measurement of that and compare that to your standard. But obviously if your standard that was made uh, a month or so ago, it's obviously going to be lighter in colour, but the uh, AB values shouldn't have altered. It should still, still be the same amount of yep. colour. This is obviously where instrumentation, but this is where instrumentation comes in because you can take that take that reading and store that data and you know that's not aged. Yep. Um, obviously if you're doing a study where it does age over a period of time and that's that's what that's what's got to be tested. Um, but again this is where you can you don't have the uncertainty of the I suppose the human eye because you've got an instrument that said these on this day these are the LAB values or this is the, the strength and you're actually able to document that and then work against that standard. And that standard as long as you I suppose it doesn't break or get lost is actually there for years to come is it? Okay, thank you. How does the, I'm not talking rubbish here, but it seems to come across something called the Pantone system. How yes. does that fit in with LAB? Pantone is a similar version, well, it's a more, no, where am I going? It's a more widely used, I'll just say the words B and Q. Um, if I wanted this blue, yeah, there you go. NCS, NCS is, a, is a form of colour standard. Pantone is a very, um, I say, when I say entry level, I don't mean the fact that the colours are different. They design their own colour, supply that to the world, and give you it in those little swatches. The 
main difference is that each one of those little strips will be different in appearance. So if, for example, if I'm just moving into a new house, if my missus says I want that colour, I guarantee if I take a Pantone strip into V&Q, it will come out completely different because there's different gloss levels on that and, to be quite honest, I've got a printer that's printing and mass producing a batch of those. Somebody in Scotland might be doing another batch of those and it's all to do with the printer will be different. Whereas your NCS is a little bit, it's a bit more expensive, but obviously each little swatch is technically calibrated and they standardise on, it's got to be printed like this, and they, they calibrate on the screen as well. Isn't there somebody somewhere though saying a Pantone number 555 is a definite LED value? Mm, well, it's, I, it's this, is where, this is where, I mean, this is where the closest we sort of get to that would be on the, on an instrument you would get the, the, the XYZ or the LAB values um, supplied with that machine to make sure the machine is actually reading that properly. Now, obviously it's an American company, they're traceable to NIST in the States. But if I were doing it here, like we do, we, we buy tiles off SRAM and we ask them to be calibrated and they calibrate against NPL, which is the National Physical Laboratory. And each standard is, is technically the same, the same consistency. Um, typically they've got, a, they've got a shelf life of five, five years, isn't it? Before you yeah. recalibrate them. Um, but that technically is, that's a consistent way of doing it. But it is quite expensive to sort of go, each Pantone with another colour to be, to be uh, sort of uh, checked. It's, you'd, you'd have, it'd be horrendous. Because you, you, each printer would be different, they'd all have to conform to one standard and it, it just won't work. Do people in printing like to believe that Pantone is precise? <laughs> yeah. This that the corporate colours are the way they should be, but it's not always quite... No, the, the issue, I mean, bigger printers, we, we, you see, this is where we, we love industrial colour measurement because we can, we do match it, we match quite well to it. Um, there tends to be a lot more money in industrial colour measurement because when a customer's driving a project, they're going to sort of say, it's got to be right, so you're going to spend, I'm not going to say the amount because I'm not too sure at the moment, um, but X, you're going to spend X on a standard and everybody's happy. In the print world, um, with your Photoshop, it's very low cost, it's very designer stage. Now printers these days, you do get some big, big printers that will invest into screen optimization. they will invest into densitometers, um, and they will invest into QC on the press. Printers, um, but smaller. A lot of work is contracted out to the smaller press. Um, the man that's got a warehouse, he's got two presses, who hasn't got. There's no money in that to sort of keep that consistent. So that's where you'll find corporate brochures do look different. And considering it's where the products are made and designed, it's one of the big areas that a lot of people don't. They don't optimise. They will optimise the screen, the, the computer, the way it looks, and they'll optimise the values that go into it. But when it's printed and it and it's plated up and printed, they just they just don't seem to. Do it. Um, we worked with a company that was a very a big leading uh, pension firm, and to be quite honest, they had something done in in the June, and towards Christmas they had another brochure done, and the, it looked terrible. And their strength was in that blue colour as well. It looked completely different. So, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> no, no, go um, it. Seems to read somewhere that women can detect about five thousand more different colour hues than men can, and I've got a wife who loves to tell me that. The tie I've just put on is uh, doesn't go with the trousers or something yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. Is there any sort of physical, biological, or psychological principle that's at work there, or is it just bias? Yeah, based on your colour tie. This is the thing, where instruments have come from isn't to try and replace the, the consumer panel that is good at reading colour, for example, but I suppose where it is is to document the standard to make that problem that, that consistent. Because, I mean, obviously a lot, of, a lot more people have got better vision than, than everybody else. Um, I've met quality managers that are absolutely brilliant on certain colours, but then when it moves to something else, they're absolutely, it, it, it's not, they're not, they're not very good. And it's, Based on, for example, LAB was, is physical colour somebody has decided on that's how that should look? And mathematical calculations are taken from that. Uh, there's something called the Munell uh, Munzel system, which was, which is colour. 
and people come up with how that's supposed to look. And it's all, it is really all subjective, and that's why they've put it on to, um, I suppose we've gone into the instrument, instrument, instrumentation method because, instrumental method, because they're able to sort of standardise on it. So, but obviously, oh. women are better than men. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Very different <Yeah. laughs> how, how consistent is one manufacturer's spectra photometer to another? Manufacturers all should come, well, all the, I mean, it's, it's not fair to say decent ones, but all the, the main um, manufacturers, so I'm not talking as a, as a rep at the moment, should all conform to four standards set by the CIE. Um, and that's, you could have, it's pointless to have a blue. This blue wall. If we're all arguing, one of it looks. If it looks green, and one says it's it's yellow or something different. So they all have to read colour or appearance in a certain way, based on. I hope you don't mind me using your. No, uh, example, do, yes. Depending on the environment, depending on the environment, there's different instruments that are built for durability over an analytical measurement, but also the cost of that instrument. Um, so a lot of the entry level machines are, su are supplied with, with a white sphere in there uh, that would typically ignore surface texture. The problem is when you're making colour or pigments, the powder tends to stick to um, the inside of that sphere. And if you just put something in between, I say, I say five thousand pounds for example, you've just bought that bit of kit as a vital QC tool. If it gets coated with the with the dust, you've got a bit of an issue because you've got to explain to a director why you need a repair, why there's going to be a repair bill or something like that. So everybody, but the point I'm trying to make is everybody should conform to a standard. There's four types of geometry that are available. The way that the instrument looks at the sample. Um, that's all based on, or supposed to be, the human perception of the appearance. Um, but again, it is application dependent. So as long as you've got an instrument that's manufactured to a CIE specification, it covers most of the visible spectrum. Um, we're, we should be in the right ballpark. And it works, of course. Any more questions? What about presentation of the sample? Because if it's a tile, it's easy, you just put it on the top. or. Yeah. Uh, if it's a powder, maybe you can just put it in a cuvette and tap it down and put it on the machine. But like you showed some examples of crisps, so how yeah. would you uh, take a, a, sh a measurement for a crisp? Because obviously yeah. unplacing sizes, uh, sizes. Sample, sample preparation is major. Um, I mean, we talk about I mean, putting powder into a glass sample cup. We try and make it like we always we always do tell customers this, and this isn't I'm not trying to sell ceram while I'm here, but we try and make them the same as one of our ceram uh, tiles. Uh, try and get that sample to look the same. Powders is nice and easy on this particular machine because you can um, pour the powder in, shake it about, make a nice consistent surface and the machine will read that very repeatably. Um, crisps, you need a larger area view. We've got an instrument that will actually, that was designed by free to lay in the States to actually replace their old ones which looks at the, the, the crisps, they rotate that and they average. Um, so what we're trying to do is build a bigger, bigger picture more, put some more averaging in there, and then you would uh, repeatably. So it's got to be level, no ambient light going in there, um, and you would get a, you get your repeatable measurement. But sample preparation is is key. We've seen a lot of, I've got to say, a lot of competitors. Whilst the, their equipment is good, um, the sample preparation isn't hasn't been brilliant. And to be honest, it, it isn't. Sometimes you see that it's, it's really not worth having an instrument because if they're firing it at the ceiling or something like that or letting ambient light in, it's not really being used um, for the product. Based on the aperture size, if you've got a small aperture size and you're sort of looking at a dark spot, your readings are going to be affected. And that's why you have a larger area view because you can see more, more of the picture you see. And typically on a machine, if you can see, you can see the sort of the larger area view, you'll be covering, I pass that around. It's um, the larger area view of the instrument is actually you're going to be covering more of an area of the of the sample uh, with that tied in with the um, the averaging as well. You, you do get a more repeatable, accurate measurement. You cut out the anomalies if, if that makes sense. Any more questions? Um, are you aware of ray tracing? Sorry, where? Ray tracing, it's modeling for CGI computer systems. Is that something you use at all? Um, I've, I've not come across it. it no, it's just. No, sorry. I've, I mean, do, is it something used for specifying colour as a standard? or? It's used for creating colour and, and shape within CGI modeling. It's, it's the maths and, and the model behind that. And I just wondered whether. 
went into that theoretical level of an important one or not? We, as, a, as a business, we do a lot of consultancy-led work. Um, typically, we've, we haven't gone into the... We, we go into colour color theory a lot of customers. Um, I suppose with the development of, of standard standard agencies, um, but typically where we've concentrated on, we've, we've been more in, we've been more on scientific, working with a lot more customers, solving the problem, and a lot of a lot of our customers are sort of saying, well, <coughs> we need something to do this time. What, what can it can it do this? How can you solve this problem? And we, I suppose, unfortunately for us, we typically get involved in. We're not involved in the creative side. We're always just involved in the problem solving. Yeah. Um, but based on, I mean, there's a lot of versions based off. Uh, tri stimulus, which is the, the XYZ. So RGB in the print world is all calculated off XYZ as well. So, no, I personally haven't come across it, but potentially it's a, a version of uh, colour space to like a colour standard. It, it, it's like the reverse almost of refractive microscope. Yeah. It's not something I've, I've come across. No, we have to just, just shake your glasses. But if I'll, I'll have a look and I don't know about it. You mentioned about the wide area view being key to accurate measurement. Yeah. If your the surface is too small for a wide area view, what's the smallest area you can actually scan with your machine? You can, I mean, based that, that the machine that's going around now, the <coughs> aperture, the area view, that sort of size, we go down to a smaller area view um, because if I mean, George got quite small at the tiles. Um, yes. Oh, the, yes, in the tiles. Mean, yeah. We obviously do an instrument for that. To make a repeatable measurement or to, to build an accurate measurement, we would average across that tile a few times, um, or you could just take a single measurement. Yep. But if it was something as small as that, and we have got a small area view, I probably would average a couple of times just to make sure I've got a repeat measurement. Um, so with your Colorflex EZ, uh, could you reduce the aperture size of that down to the size of those tiles, so yep. 10 mil or whatever? Yeah. The mini scan that's going around now is obviously portable, but you can put smaller area of using. But this this port plate will actually comes in a multitude of different um, sizes. So depending on the product, you can you can go from the larger area view down to the smaller. Okay. So it's that is that is possible. What's the value of this machine? Cash. <laughs> yeah. Well on eBay so Well, a few thousand pounds. Three thousand. Few. Uh, no, what bit? So don't drop it. Yes, yeah, so please don't drop it. <laughs> Tom's prepared to, to negotiate later. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> You've gone quiet again, but every time you go quiet, another question comes. <laughs> any more questions? I mean, is there any? Any more, sorry, any more live yeah. examples, any question, uh, application type question? <coughs> it's fine, it's all right. That's okay, thank you for listening. Thank you. John, could I ask you to propose a vote of thanks, please? Do you want me to walk to the front? No, just stand right here. <laughs> I'd um, like to thank Tom for stepping up the last moment and providing us with quite an interesting talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you. At least no one's asleep. <laughs> <laughs>